This video was sponsored by CuriosityStream in partnership with my streaming service Nebula. Hey, happy Friday. This week I'll talk about finally, officially saying goodbye to small phones. I'll talk about a digital piece of art selling for 69 million US dollars. And I'll also talk about Apple bringing one of its most exciting chip facilities to Europe to compete against Qualcomm. As every Friday, we also have a tech knowledge quiz with 20 brand new questions. So check that out. Links are in the description and welcome to the Friday checkout. Okay, this week I'm actually starting with my three personal release highlights. My favorite gadget of the week has to be the Insta360 GO 2, quite possibly the smallest and cutest action camera ever, and it comes with a genius charging case that acts as a tripod, a charger, and a screen to show you stats while the camera is docked. And when you take that camera out, it is so small you can actually do really cool shots that would have otherwise be pretty much impossible. My second highlight is the HTC Vive Facial Tracker a weird little gizmo that you attach to your headset so it can read your facial expressions and speech and translate that into VR, which uh, looks even more dorky than a regular VR headset, but I guess could be pretty fun if you spend a lot of time socializing in VR. And my final gadget highlight of the week will have to be the Asus ROG Phone 2. The top end model has a screen on the back, multiple customizable buttons on the back, 18 gigs of RAM, which is more than my desktop PC has, and two USB-C ports again. It's a completely bonkers device and it's not a phone for me personally, but I really love how hard Asus is leaning into this niche. Those are my three personal highlights and our full release monitor with a list of all of the gadgets that were announced this week is linked in the description. So check that out if you want to stay up to date with everything new in one really compact article. Okay, and my first proper story of the week will be the final nail in the coffin for tiny phones. The final blow came this week that despite expectations, the iPhone 12 mini did super poorly and Nikkei reporting that Apple is cutting its manufacturing by at least 70% for the rest of the year. Apparently, the mini only made up 10 to 15% of all iPhones Apple originally ordered from its suppliers, but even that was way too much as Reuters reports the mini only made up 5% of all US iPhone shipments in the first month of the year. 5%, that figure is only an estimate for a single month in a single market, but 5% is basically a rounding error, and even less than the 11% that the original iPhone SE sold back in its best days. The SE was Apple's first attempt at bringing back tiny phones in case you have forgotten about it already. The Mini is their second attempt, and this means that neither really worked well for Apple, despite having basically everything else going for them. First, both of these phones were basically budget models. The iPhone SE, obviously, and even the 12 mini is 100 bucks cheaper than the regular 12. And budget models typically sell really well for Apple. Just take a look at the similarly priced 10R, which at some point made up almost half of all iPhone sales, or the newer SE that accounts for almost a quarter. Second, especially with the mini, Apple actually made a really good phone and cut no corners. I mean, apart from the battery, the thing has essentially the same specs as the regular 12, including even MagSafe and 5 5G and reviewers all seem to have loved it. And third, the Mini is also part of the iPhone 12 series, which in general is doing incredibly well when it comes to sales. So these phones, and especially the Mini, have underperformed despite the price, the specs, the reviews, and all the general performance of the iPhone 12 series going for them. And I think this kind of serves as a cautionary tale for judging online content in general, right? If you read a lot of online comments or watch a lot of online reviews, there's a couple of things that people will say they desperately want again and again. You hear things like, we want small phones, we want micro SD slots, um, we want stock Android. And there's a couple of these things that just get repeated again and again and again. It's easy to believe that those are actually what the things that consumers want. But when we look at the real sales data, the two often really don't match up. Now, there are rumors that Sony might revive their compact phone line, and they have indeed actually brought back the audio jack for some of their phones too, for example, and that might work for them because by now they're so small that for them, even serving a tiny market could still provide growth. But almost for everyone else, we're probably stuck with big phones for now. 
Okay, my second story of the week will be digital artist Beeple selling his art for $69 million via what is known as NFTs. Now, I've been following Beeple for a long time and for over 13 years he has created what is known as the dailies. One new piece of art every day, without exception. Images, videos, just lots of random really cool stuff. And he basically made a collection of 5,000 of these dailies, so basically all of his dailies, that he auctioned off via an auction house called Christie's via NFTs, or non-fungible tokens. If you want to have a full explanation of NFTs, I've linked to a very good one down in the description, but the very oversimplified version of it is that somebody takes something, for example, a digital piece of art, and they attach a unique digital cryptographic token. That token is on a public blockchain, for example, Ethereum, and it makes it very easy to actually establish who has the token and who owns the thing by extension. That token can be traded, it can be bought, it can be sold, and this enables ownership over digital things, for example, art, pretty much for the first time ever. And having real cryptographic proof that somebody owns a digital thing that is kind of revolutionary on the one hand, and it could have fantastic outcomes, but it also could have some pretty horrible outcomes. On the one hand, I am super happy for Beeple. He is an incredibly hardworking and kind guy. He has put a lot of his work, including full 3D models, up online for free for anyone to use for years. And if anyone deserves to get filthy rich off of digital art, it is definitely him. And digital artists in general have always had a really hard time monetizing on their creations, which might change with NFT, especially since you can actually build smart contracts into them. So for example, a photographer could upload their photo to a photo sharing website, and every time that website sells that photo to a client or licenses it, you can build a smart contract to track that and actually automatically get royalties for that, which is really cool. But like with most things happening on the blockchain, the environmental cost of NFTs are sadly also absolutely horrendous, to the point where buying and selling a single piece of art can currently use more electricity than the average human consumes in multiple weeks. Yeesh. Okay, and my third story of the week will be Apple bringing a new chip design center to Munich, which will be its biggest one in Europe yet, with the company saying it will invest approximately a billion euros into the facility over the coming three years. The center will likely focus on designing Apple's own in-house 5G modems, which are supposed to let Apple break their ties with Qualcomm, whose wireless stack they are currently using in their iPhones. As a reminder, Apple absolutely hates working with Qualcomm, and up until recently, the two were busy suing each other to death, claiming the other party is basically extorting money from them. Apple recently also bought Intel's wireless chip business, which tried and failed to compete against Qualcomm on their own, and the theory is that Intel's IP, coupled with Apple's chip design expertise, could theoretically lead to great wireless chips that Apple can design for themselves. And Munich is an interesting place for three reasons. One, it is already Apple's largest development center in Europe, with over 1,500 employees. Two, Munich is home to Infineon, the largest chip maker in all of Europe and a top 10 player worldwide, as well as a few great technical universities, so there's a lot of talent in the region. And three, the EU has just announced that this week that they will heavily support strengthening the semiconductor industry in the next decade, as they see it as strategically important given all of the recent geopolitical tensions. I am right now working on a super in-depth video on how the semiconductor industry works, together with a breakdown of the aforementioned geopolitical implications, and like all of my long-form content, that will drop a day or two early and completely without ads on Nebula, our very own video streaming service that is owned by me and many of YouTube's best educational content creators. If you like smart videos and like supporting the people who make it, I think you would love Nebula. Creators include real engineering, practical engineering, the efficient engineer, and many non-engineering channels like Wendover Productions, Tier Zoo, and more. All of our regular videos get uploaded there at free and without Google's tracking, of course, and the platform lets us get creative and do unusual content without having to worry about upsetting the YouTube algorithm. So many creators do whole Nebula original shows or series, like full-length, hour-long documentaries that wouldn't be viable on YouTube, or unusual collabs that don't really fit our regular content on YouTube, such as Wendover Productions' Trivia Show. 
Best of all, you can access all of it for free with a subscription to my sponsor CuriosityStream, which itself is less than 15 bucks for an entire year. That's like barely more than a dollar a month. CuriosityStream is of course the premier place on the internet for high quality professional documentaries from the founder of the Discovery Channel, and they have a huge library of science, nature, and history content to binge while you are stuck at home. I've recently finished watching an episode of Catalyst on CuriosityStream, which took a closer look at the potential of quantum computing, and there's a ton of other great content here from hosts like David Attenborough, Jane Goodall, Stephen Hawking, and more. So check them out at the link in the description, and I'll see you next week.